Hi, this is Sean Wildermuth with Coding Shorts. Today I want to talk about .NET 7's new features for Minimal API. Some of these are really interesting and you might want to move to .NET 7 because of them, but you may not need to. Let's dig in what these new features are and why you might want to move to .NET 7 to use them. Let's get started. So I'm here in Visual Studio and I don't have a project at all. And if I look at .NET version, you'll see that I'm running the RC1 of 7.0. And this is important in that I'm writing this before the releases come out, but it's an RC, most things are gonna be pretty clear. What I'm gonna to wanna to do is just create a new project. I'm gonna create an empty web project because that is just a very clean, small version of a web server that already has minimal API sort of propped up in it. And I'm gonna name it min api and i'm just going to create it here in this directory so i'm going to output it in this directory so we have this very simple project and all we really have in this program is create the builder notice we don't have any services at this point we may want to introduce those and we have the builder and then we have that minimal api that if you've used .NET 6 you should be pretty familiar with now the idea of mapping a get a post to put in here and so we're really going to talk about two different features here. We're going to be call, we're going to talk about groups and we're going to talk about filters. These are two new things that I think will really get you interested in using minimal API cuz it because minimal API is a pretty new technology as you probably know and that means that that first version that came out with .NET 5 is pretty rough. It's missing some features to make it easier to sort of architect your minimal APIs. And a couple of these, and grouping really, and grouping really starts by trying to allow you to do that. So let's start with grouping. First of all, I'm just gonna create a quick class I'm gonna call person, and I'm just creating it here just for ease. I'm gonna create a constructor. And yes, I could do this all in Visual Studio as well. I just want to be pretty close to the bone here. And I'm going to pass in a name for the person. And then I'm going to have name equals name. Just have it create a. And then I'm going to just say prop string name. And I'll just say to make it immutable, I'm just going to say this is just init. And it doesn't like this public on person since we don't have it here. So let's leave the public there and let's put a public here. And I always forget that. We don't need that. And so here we have a simple person, not interesting. I'm actually going to collapse this. We're just going to use this to return. So if we were going to do a standard minimal API here, we might have something like API people. And let's just instantiate a person here, new, new person. And in our Lambda here, I'm just going to return person, right? Really, really simple. Probably going to make this more complex as we go on. And if we come down here, we can just say .NET run because the only thing we're really looking at, the API for people, right? Make this nice and big so you can see we're returning that data. Everything works there in the way you want. And if we come back to the code here, this all works in the way we want. But what if we want a second call here for ID and let's say it's going to have an integer. And here we want to return that person and here we might want to return a new array of person supplying that first person, right? We're gonna have two distinct APIs here. And this is pretty easy to do. We've seen people do this before. Notice I'm not really using this ID. And so here I'm gonna bring in that integer, which I'm not using, but I could be using it to do some sort of query. So if I stop and restart this and do our API again, we'll see it's now an array. And if I come over here and put really any ID, I'm gonna get that any ID that's a number, and if I want to put Sean here, it's going to say 404 because there is no route that matches that, right? And this is fine. If you've seen Minimal API or I have another video on Minimal API that might be useful to you, go ahead and look at that. But what we get into trouble here is we might want certain things like requires authorization here. And we end up needing to put this on each and every section here. So we're going to use a new idea called a uh, group. And we do this by saying app map group. We're going to give that group 
a prefix, a prefix that all of the APIs inside of it are gonna use. And of course, that's gonna be our people here, right? And so we can now, if you've done MVC before, you can see kind of where this is going. It's similar in that, as I'm gonna tell the person group itself to map get and map get. And then I don't need the prefix. And so our code becomes a little cleaner here in that it's the group that has this. And having this work, let's uh, restart this. And then we're gonna see that even though we've taken those pieces out, our old API works in exactly the same way we expect it to, right? So what's the benefit here? Sure, having the prefix here is useful, but it also means that this group can add its own things like cache output, requires authorization, require cores, of course, not all of this is gonna work. We know authorization hooked up. We don't have cores defined. And you can see that a lot of the things that you would need to do on an individual item, like require rate limiting authorization, or even putting the uh, information about the um, description or display name, which may be something you're gonna to wanna to do on an API basis alone, but we can give it a group name here, and let's call this our people group. I'm going to comment out a couple of these since those aren't really going to work. This allows us to add group-wide requirements here. Sure, we could have added authorization to the entire object, but if we had authorization here, we could still add things like allow anonymous here in case that is a method that allows anonymous. And this is really an answer to the way that MVC does this with attributes for the most part. And so this is going to allow you to handle these things in more of a group. Are you still gonna build them all in program? Maybe not. Maybe you'll have some classes or functions or methods that you call that create everything for a group. That might be an option. But this just gives you less repeated and duplicated code, which I think is the real benefit here. The other thing we're gonna talk about are filters. Now filters are an, a concept that come back from MVC in ASP.NET, not ASP.NET Core, but it goes back quite a ways. And one of the things that people wanted to be able to do was add interceptors, as add filters to do their own work without having to write a complete piece of middleware or write something like an attribute that you had to apply to each of these. And these are supported at the group level as well as the individual level. And the way these work is the last one I'll add one at the group level is I can say add endpoint filter. And this is going to allow us to, whether it's inline here, pass in some context. And what you need to do is pass in the context of the call and the next method. So if you're looking at this, this looks a lot like middleware because it's kind of a tiny version of middleware that's just going to apply to this group or individual items. Now because of the nature of them, they need to be async and then we need to at some point call that next passing in that context. So in this case, this endpoint filter does nothing, but we could certainly come in here and say if context.request and you can see in here the context object is an HTTP context, but a filter context that has access to HTTP context. And I'm just going to go request headers contains key for X my secret header. Then I'm going to return that next. So if my header is included, that's all great. Otherwise, I'm going to return results.problem header is missing. And so in this way, this code is gonna be checked every time we get down here, right? This is a filter that is going to allow you to do things before the API is called and also after, because we could, instead of grabbing this next, is we could get the result and then ultimately return it after we look at what's happened during the request. So it is a tiny piece of middleware in the way it works, but it still allows you to do those same things. If we go ahead and restart this, just so you can see how it works. 
when we refresh this, we're going to get that problem result that says, hey, the header's missing, and that this is a status 500, which is where problem comes in. You could certainly return other status codes as well. Depends on what you want to do in here, depending on this. And so in this case, this your API was never called because it didn't satisfy something. While you can add endpoint filters here in line, and for one-offs, that makes a lot of sense, more often, you're going to create a class, and I'll call it our custom header filter. And we're going to drive from I endpoint filter. Now, this name is interesting because I endpoint filter implies that you could actually add these filters at any endpoint, and that these, the group level and the API level, are just other endpoints. And so let's go ahead and implement that interface. And all that it does is pass you in, surprise, surprise, is it passes in that context and the next. And so if we just grab this content and put it inside of our execution of that filter, and I'm just gonna change this to be CTX, since that's what I named it before. And let's make this a sync so that await works then we have a custom filter. So the creation of these is super simple. And this is a good use case if you wanna reuse it because I'll take this name and instead of calling add endpoint filter here, I'll say add endpoint filter with the type specified in here as the filter I want to add to it. And it'll do all the magic for us. If we run again and come back here, we'll see that the error is still happening because our endpoint filter is requiring it. And just to prove and make it so it'll be usable once you get this sample code, if you end up grabbing it, I'll just comment this out so that it actually does allow that filter to happen. And we'll just say, let's add a constructor for custom filter. And I'm gonna add a logger for it. So that down here we can just say, logger log info before next after next and then here i'll just return that result we got from it and this way i can show you that we can do things before and after we call the actual api endpoint let's run it one more time and we'll refresh this it'll suddenly work so we can see this showed up here and then down here we can see before next and after next directly in the log and so in this way, we have full ability to create these mini pieces of middleware directly for your minimal APIs as you might need it. Hope this makes sense. Thanks for joining me on this coding short. Make sure and like and subscribe if you got this far and liked what you saw. And please feel free to share this video with anyone you'd like. I could use all the views I can I'm trying to build up this little experiment as much as I can. And thanks for joining me. I'll see you next time on Coding Shorts.